Hello, welcome to Truth Not Tradition, online Bible study for January 28, 2017. I'm Tony Smario, coming to you from my father, brosal.org, YouTube channel. And um, this week I just have a, a, a short message to give in place of the normal Bible study, which I'm really trying to return to. I was just reading ahead in the book of Job. I feel inspired to cover the book of Revelation again um, with the sort of the new knowledge that I feel keeps bubbling up to the surface of history and in my own mind of looking at things to see if we can extract any, any more uh, reality from it because uh, I keep realizing that we're all so caught up in the illusion that's been painted for us for a very long time. It's not something that even our own friends or family or pastors, teachers, you know, they got it from somewhere. The best teachers today got their teaching from some master that they learned it from, who got it from somebody. And it goes back to some centralized system that was at one point funded for a reason. And so there is a reason that history is written by the victor and and the history books change. And so to think that, that, uh, that we possess somehow the, the truth in, in the face of a world so manipulated and changed and that God hasn't, that the God that we believe is so, you know, beyond even reckoning uh, as far as you know, who knows the mind of God? Who can say what God's really doing? <laughs> as a Christian, you know, as far as what Jesus really did, you know, he came and even though he was the master, he led a life as a servant, as an example of this is what he said, you've seen me, you've seen the father. This is what the spirit of God looks like in a man. That's as close as we can get what we saw if we're if we believe the story is that that spirit of God then raised him from the dead because the ground couldn't keep him and it didn't keep him because he was only three days to fulfill uh, the sign what he did in those three days is reported that he went and you know preached to people in this the spiritual uh, world of the afterlife so just to embrace Christianity is to embrace a much bigger world than what the religion of Christianity presents to us today. Sinners are going to hell only if you believe in Jesus. See, and I think they have a confusion between sinners and believers. Believers are also sinners, which Christians acknowledge. So they imagine that by being a believer, their sins don't matter. This is the way I learned it, right? That's why your works don't matter as a Christian. Your only work that matters, keep believing that Jesus died for you. As long as you keep believing that, it doesn't matter what you do. But I say the rest of the scripture, that's not what it says. And, and if, you, if you imagine that what the rest of the scripture points to so thoroughly is this works-based idea all the way back to what we're reading in the book of Job. It's all about, you know how it is. You keep that, you tow that line. You do good. And what is, what do they say good is? You know, helping the needy, being a pillar for others, this type of thing, right? That's, that's what righteousness stood for, apparently, in Job's time, at, at least in the legend that the poet is leaving with us. That's what being right with God meant. It wasn't about being the strongest warrior, apparently. That comes down later through, say, Greek, Homer, you know, the gods, and, and, and not necessarily, the gods are with the strongest warrior, but the, that doesn't even make them necessarily the best person. But in Christianity, it's pretty clear that a belief in this God amounts to works <laughs> that that spirit produces in you. And the works that are so clearly produced are being able to give up this life for this belief that you have. So it's only in those works that the belief is demonstrated. 
I say most of Christianity, like Jesus points out, they don't believe. We don't believe. I'm happy to include myself in that. I, I, I think I believe, like the rest of us, but I'm, I'm willing to say, I don't live for others. I live for myself. I don't put my trust in him. I worry about tomorrow, what I'm going to eat, what I'm going to drink, what I'm going to wear, how I'm going to get by. I mean, sure, it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a middle ground there that we ride. I ride that fence. I put my trust in him, but do I really completely? Do, do I just walk with no fear because of my trust in him? Or do I only have no fear based on how much money's in my pocket, how secure my, my things are, my, my, my safety, my dwelling, my, right? I'm warm. I got a jacket. I don't have to f fear freezing to death tonight. So, okay, I can trust God. He gave me a jacket, right? Did he give me, you know, three jackets in different colors? Did he give me four pair of shoes? Did he give me a house with more room than I need? And do I share it with others or do I just look at it as more insurance for myself? So, I mean, it seems clear to me that all Christianity amounts to the religious side, the real connection with God is in the understanding of this complete abandonment of, of the cares and comforts of this life, not just in the sense, the Buddhist sense of abandonment, of detaching from them because they're not real, but almost in the opposite sense of detaching, not of maintaining the attachment because there's nothing that can be done. It is real, but through faith, through belief in the master, following that example, you know, laying those cares at that doorstep, right? Putting that load on that beast of burden to carry and allowing myself to live a life of complete trust in God the way he did. So that seems to be what the religion of Christianity amounts to. And if you look at what it would produce as a person, you see the first church. You see perhaps the Apostle Paul is the, you know, as what Christianity is always understood as the chief example of what a, a believer looks like. And, you know, who can argue that? I'm not, I'm not arguing that Paul was the, the chief believer. He called himself the chiefest of sinners. And yet, from what he writes, he didn't seem to have a wife or a little boy companion like most of them did in those days. So he was celibate of his own choice, which you can see was a spiritual choice, even as a Pharisee, because he didn't just, you know, he wasn't like 16 years old, it doesn't sound like. He was already a Pharisee. How long did he have to study to become a Pharisee in his own right, in the Jewish faith? And so he was celibate through all of that by choice, by spiritual choice. It wasn't like, I've become a Christian, so I won't take a wife. No, he tells the people, I wish you could become as I am, someone who prefers to give my life over to God in this life than to give my life over to lust and, and comforts appetites and so that's the real struggle when you look at what it means to give up this life and be a servant you know how many christians do who even wants to be that you just want to believe you're going to raise from the dead you know i just want to live but i don't really want to follow the master like he did which means what well i don't believe then that that's god it's got to be the conclusion Otherwise, you'd see it in my actions. I'd be anxious to follow that, wouldn't I? If I really believed that that's where God was, that was eternal life. Not just saying, I believe in Jesus, I believe, but give me my, you know, satisfy my appetites every minute of the day. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for my big house. Thank you, Jesus, for all my clothes. Thank you, Jesus, for all my comforts. You know, that I share a pittance with my neighbor. So... Um, yeah, you know, and so years ago, this is what I, you know, for me, the message today, because I'm, I'm tired from a bunch of things going on in my own life this past week, and I haven't been able to properly prepare for the, the Bible study and read ahead of Job or Revelation like I want to. And, and I, yet I feel that it's probably the most important part of 
uh, this ministry. You know, seeing through Donald Trump should be easy for people. I realize it isn't, unfortunately. Seeing through this charade that they put in front of us, imagining America ever was great at anything but taking things from people and hurting people that were innocent. Uh, that's what America's been great at, and it's been free to do it. So it's been great and free in that sense only. And any real Christian who followed Christ should feel that quite clearly in their own sense of proportion. But as I say, I grew up just a consumer-based American, thinking I was so self-righteous and entitled to a better life because we're the great free country of America who keeps people free and we do the right thing. We send food to starving people. Yeah, food that's laced with sterilization. After we made the people starving because we went in with our banking system and drove them broke. And if we didn't do it that way, we sent guns and got them into civil wars. And if we didn't do it that way, we sent our corporate people to invade them outright and either buy them off or expose the people who needed to be politically undermined so we could get our way in their country. So, you know, this is our history as America. We're not, we're not great, not in the eyes of God, I can't imagine. There's nothing great about us. The fact that we call ourselves Christian, I think, is our big shame. The fact that we pretend to be Christian but don't act it. And so what, what dawned on me this week as I was reflecting on, you know, wanting to say something to the people who are following the Bible study is something that I've been discussing for maybe a decade now, uh, with my father and when when my cousin, the the fundamentalist, self-righteous hypocrite that got me into Christianity, when I used to see how he talked about other people, of course, the you know, Islam, devil's religion, Hindu with their Krishna, devil's religion, all this kind of stuff, right? Everybody was the devil. If they didn't know Jesus, they were the devil. Yet my Bible says seven spirits went out from God's throne into all the world. I don't know what they're doing in all the world for all that time before the Messiah came. And all these religions that seek to connect man with this, acknowledging this higher authority. And so what I realize is when you look at, say, Judaism and Christianity, you see, to me, a real false expression of religion. You see people who talk the talk but don't walk the walk. I mean, I'm not talking about the true believers. That's in every culture. I'm saying you look at the state of Israel who claims to be God's people and, you know, they don't act like it. Even the Israelis I've known there, it's just like Christianity and Catholicism. It's all just a, it's an overarching sort of sentimentality and theme. Oh God, and we go through the rituals, Christmas or Hanukkah. And the family gets together and it's about eating and it's about, oh yes, isn't it a lovely ritual? But nobody really changes their life to think that money isn't important or that they shouldn't have any cares about tomorrow because if they put their cares in God's hands, God's more worried about that than he is the sparrows in the trees who don't worry about tomorrow, that your life is just there to be spent in faith. Who cares how long it lasts? Who cares what kills you? if you're living in that true faith. When I read about St. Francis of Assisi, that seems to be the spirit that he caught finally, that he was just going to take it seriously. He was going to take the scripture seriously and absolutely give his own life as a, as a sign that he took it seriously, like a ransom for everyone, for the animals, for the trees, for anything God might desire of him and his body and his mind and his freedom. He gave it all over. Take it. And, I, and not take it grudgingly, but I'm so happy that I found this, that, that it makes me happy to give, give, give my skin, my life, my thoughts, um, to not keep them for myself, want for myself, worry about myself. You know, that seems to be the deeper spiritual battle. And when I look at the cultures that are doing something about it, America doesn't seem to be the one that stands out to me, right? In these other cultures, like Hindu cultures, in, at least in the past, 
children were sent off to some teacher or guru, a spiritual teacher, to live their young life to grasp the deeper truths of life that had nothing to do with the marketplace and and status in the community and popularity. They had to do with learning humility and and the value of labor, what it produced, and the recognition of a higher purpose and a higher authority in the universe, that there was a God and that you were God's child and that you had a, a purpose to fulfill in life. And it had to do with not just taking everything in front of you that you want, but in finding a harmony with the way that purpose and that God operated, which had to do with morality. It had to do with responsibility. It had to do with service and respect and, you know, rituals that surrounded the continuation of that. This is the way children, that was school. Okay. That was school. How do you imagine Paul would have felt about the way we send kids to school, knowing that you don't talk about God and God's, you know, you, in other words, the separation of church and state, you just keep your God to yourself and people who go to school to understand that God is first, that God's the very first thing that matters. Everything that harmonizes with God is what's right and good. And everything that doesn't, doesn't matter how good it feels or how good it might, uh, you know, the, the good you can argue it's doing. If it's against the good that is God, the right that is the harmony with the ultimate reality, well, then it, it has to be seen for what it is. So, you know, to pretend our culture is anything but secular and practically, you know, it's materialist is what it is under the name of God, which is why I think Revelation says, Church of Laodicea, wish you were hot or cold, right? You don't deny God, but you don't live like God. You say, Jesus, 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 we're Christians, we're Christians, we're Christians. And yet what you really believe in is military power, xenophobic popularism, self-righteous uh, spiritualism. All this absolute BS, right? So, and then I looked years ago, this used to drive my cousin nuts. And it was part of the sign to me that I was on the right track. When I look at Islam, for instance, isn't it interesting that here's the devil's religion, as I used to say to my cousin, how's Jesus going to feel, I wonder, when he returns, and it's all the devil's people that actually give a crap about whether God approves of their activity, that actually go so far as to put limits on their own freedoms just so that they don't disrespect the, the boundaries that they know exists between them and their God. So it's that obedience that they, you know, I look at it as something that in my Christian view is part of the freedom. Jesus came to set us free from such a, a worship of obedience. We don't have to worship God that way, but the, I'm just saying the works, does that not display works of people who believe that God is more important than worldly desires and comforts, you know? Now, are we going to argue whether it, there is put on as our religions? No, I imagine it's all the same. The popular religions, as, as my Iranian friend tells me, the mullahs are all in the pocket of the bank, Western bankers. So that's going on everywhere. I'm just saying as a culture, the cultural norm is to accept that there is a God and that the laws are there to protect you from overstepping the boundaries with the most important thing. And it's that obedience that becomes the chief sig uh, uh, signal to the world. Look at the obedience. They bow every day, five times a day. They don't eat certain things. They don't drink. They cover their face. They don't put the boys and girls together. You know, they have all these ways that you can observe casually in their culture in which they're obviously participating in some obedience ritual to their God. I'm just saying if Jesus showed up tomorrow, wouldn't he like to find the Christians being obedient to some of the things, you know, drinking wine, but not getting drunk kind of idea, right? Giving to their neighbors, not holding up 
for themselves, not thinking about what they can get for themselves, but giving, you know, going through the works. And then Hinduism, right? This acknowledgement that God is supreme. Um, the chanting, if you've ever listened to any of like the Krishna chanting, Krishna's there, Jesus Christ, their embodiment of God's spirit in a human form. Long before Jesus, they, they claim in their legend. But when you listen to some of the chants, it's so joyful and uplifting. And I imagine when I listen to it that, huh, if I, if I simply replaced the word Krishna with Christ and think of my Jesus of Nazareth, I wonder, geez, wouldn't Jesus appreciate if he came back and, and we were so into him and what he did and what he represented in the world that it was just part of our whole cultural norm to constantly be chanting in a joyful manner his name. Oh, Christ, 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 how happy we are. What you did, what you did, thank you, thank you. We're so happy, Christ, Christ, Christ. Do you think that would be works that you could see what that belief brought out in people? So I just find it interesting. I want Christians to realize that, who are the, the few that are listening to me, because it took me some overcoming to imagine that these these other people with these devil's religions that didn't know Jesus, you know, could have anything like a connection with God and not the devil. And I now realize it's, if anyone is connected to the devil, it shows in their works. And so I don't care what you call yourself. God says you can tell a tree by its fruit. That's what the scripture says anyway. So it doesn't matter if you say that you're an apple tree. If, you know, limes are coming off you, you know, you're a lime tree. You're just deluded into thinking you're an apple tree. And I say that's the analogy of Christianity today. We're deluded into thinking that we're Christian when the truth is we're very secular and we're almost, you know, we live, our works are almost completely materialistic in their philosophical scope. We do not live our life, and, I, and I'm generalizing in, in Christianity as a cultural example. It does not look like Christians care about serving their neighbor and being a pleasure to their God, Jesus. Except, of course, to, to say, Jesus saves me, Jesus saves me, and once a week go sing a few songs in church, and, and then go back to worrying about the buying and the selling, and who's screwing who, which show is our favorite show on television, you know, all these worldly things that are much harder to interrupt than to interrupt our singing of praise to Jesus or to interrupt our giving of ourself to someone in need or to interrupt our cleansing of our attachment to this world of desire and appetite worship. Just to, you know, to put ourselves through some aesthetic motions, whether it's a fast, whether it's just, you know, cleaning out your closet and giving away a few of your favorite things that you haven't worn in years that could keep somebody warm in this cold winter and just go give them away. It's hard. You know, I've, I've done it a couple of times now. It gets easier, I think, but I tell you, it's, it's hard to, to, we get very attached to those things and our culture reinforces all that attachment just like our media reinforces the delusion that donald trump is somehow different than anybody else that somehow donald trump might do anything good for anyone or cares to do anything except the program that he was sent there to carry out that delusion is so strong that it carries us away just like the delusion of our, our materialistic Americanism carries us away into works that are lukewarm, period. And I include myself in that. You know, that's how I, I know it so well. And so, you know, Christians 
are among the most brainwashed people, and most of them are among the most brain dead because they've been, you know, highly, highly focused on for quite some time, maybe a hundred years or more, in the way that their training and their programming would go. So that now they're among the densest of people with the most limited view that call their Islamic brothers and sisters, you know, terrorists because they're Islamic, that they belong to a terrorist religion when it's clearly the Christian religion that built all the guns and started all the wars, funded all the banks. Every anti-Christian thing that's gone on in the last hundred years has been funded and carried out almost entirely by the Christian world. So to imagine that it, the Muslims are the terrorists is simply to be a dupe and not know your history, not know your Bible, not even be able to acknowledge the facts that are clearly visible once you turn the television off and do some research for yourself into the facts rather than listen to your favorite talking head feed you your favorite form of hypnotism so uh, i just you know i wanted to make a, a shorter message today i'm going to get back to the bible study i hope there's a few people that are missing it i'm missing it because i i find that it's it always brings me back to the reality of why I'm a Christian in the first place, because I believe this guy was really the embodiment of the Spirit of God. And that God raised him from the dead to validate that reality. And because of that, there's this hope that, that something miraculous is uh, is going to happen for me and for I think everyone but I you know on the personal level as I say why why do I believe in this you know why do I want to be a Christian and give up all my comfort in this life for what you know what's the prize oh eternal life I love to hear Christians they're so happy for eternal life but you know he told the rich young ruler you want to be perfect he said, what do I have to do to get eternal life? He said, you know, follow the laws, which I'm going to say Christians don't do to begin with, because Jesus said there's only one law, do unto others, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. And we don't do that. I'm sorry, very few of us, I, I rarely meet a human being who does that. And it's so funny that in the modern world, when I do, invariably, they're not a Christian. So... Uh, you know, that's a sign of that, that our Bible's true. <laughs> Revelation's not lying. There's only a couple praiseworthy Christians in the whole bunch. The ones that are willing to die for it and the ones that love their brother like a Philadelphian. Right? Those are the praiseworthy people in the eyes of the master. Everybody else needs to wake up, you know, and see the truth. Right? If you overcome... If you overcome, he keeps telling the church, if you overcome, if you overcome, overcome what? The non-belief? That doesn't make any sense. You can only overcome that once and you can't even overcome that unless you've been called to it by God, according to Paul. So you're only offered the choice. So that's not an overcoming. What's the overcoming once you're part of the church? that he's telling to the seven churches if you'll overcome. They've already accepted that Jesus is the Messiah. What's to overcome? The gravity of this world. Mammon. Money. Ego. Fame. Acknowledgement of ourself. Wanting to be better than others. Wanting to be more than our neighbor. So... You know, that's the only true Christianity. And it's the hardest thing in the world and the easiest, paradoxically, at the same time. The easiest because it's a it's a moment-by-moment moment opportunity to just jump in the ring. Hardest because jumping in the ring is to abandon everything the world has 
conformed onto us and confirmed for us is is right, is good, is the the path to be on, and everything else is shown to us as an aberration and a discomfort and right you're a fool you're a clown and so to to be a you know think of jesus what he must have looked like this jew that came along that could heal people but wouldn't wouldn't use the power to just take over the temple and say you know boom call fire down on all them lying pharisees and burn them in their place and have everybody just fall on their knees and worship him if you're going to believe the legend, you have to believe that that was possible for him. He was able to braid a whip and drive the money changers out of the temple. So he claims all the spiritual power in the universe. So you have to believe that he allowed himself to play this absurd role of being laughed at and mocked. Trying to show them something else while they're mocking him because you can't be our messiah you you simple dirty man you're healing but who knows by what spirit you're healing certainly not the one we're you know not the messiah you know and he allowed that to go on when he could have changed they kept asking him for a sign and he said you wicked people you're looking for a sign because you're wicked you'd see god in me if you weren't already wicked and bent on stealing the widow's property and having the best seat at the banquet and, you know, being so proud and owning so much, you're already wicked. So you can't see what I'm saying. You can't see that I am the embodiment of those scriptures. I am what Moses claimed. So yeah, a sign, a wicked person looks for a sign. You should see it in the actions you see it in the works just like I see it in the actions of Islamic people who, by virtue of their belief that God wants them to do it, they bow, they, they, they go through these rituals of obedience, right? The Hindu who everything in their life is based on the fact that there is some sort of God out there and they're, they're part of that plan, right? That's the works. Christian and Jewish works, what? Have a bigger military, have a bigger house, have a better job, no matter that it comes at the expense of everything that, the, the, that our master declared unrighteous and evil. I mean, the only time he uses the word hell in the whole Bible, the Ghana, the only time it's ever used is primarily by Jesus threatening the Pharisees for being money-hungry, selfish people pigs using the word of God for their own benefit so you know that's what modern Christianity and Zionist Judaism represent and so this message is to point out to Christians that you know you're, we're not right about hardly anything if we're right about the fact that Jesus came out of that grave then we should be showing the world through our actions. You don't have to tell them. You don't have to threaten them. Tell them they're going to hell. You believe it and they don't. So you're going to heaven and they're going to hell. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. That's not what the scripture really says at all. It says God called you to believe it. Nothing you can do about it, but accept the offer or deny it. Like many, if you read your scripture, when Jesus told them, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, You'll never see the kingdom. And they said, well, how, how can we, what are you talking about? This is a hard teaching. He said, you know what? Many are going to fall away because they can't take the heat. And it says many of his disciples went away. They couldn't understand this guy. His teaching didn't fit and they couldn't remain a disciple of his. They liked the fact he's healing people, but they couldn't remain a disciple. And so, if you believe this, you're in a very small group that was promised by Paul. You were called to either accept it or not accept it. And if you accept it, you're promised quite a reward, it would seem. Right? Your sins are covered. Your works that should send you to the place that you deserve for your works 
are covered. But those, the rest of the world, still on, they're still on works. They're not on the offer. They weren't made the offer of Jesus just because you went and threatened them. That's not the offer that you were made. If God's calling them, then they were made the offer, and only God knows whether He offered them that. But every single person in the world is obviously not offered that because Paul says only those that God calls. Many are called, few are chosen. So Christians want to pretend that that means everybody's going to hell, but that's not what it says. It says if you're a, a selfish person who steals from the widows and orphans, you're a child of hell, and you're in danger of the hellfire of Gehenna. But no such thing as threatening every person to hell that doesn't believe in Jesus. It's not there. So why do Christians keep believing that? The truth is, if you've been called to believe it, you're called to follow Him. That's it. That's, that's your calling. Just believing it leaves you in that slippery slope of producing no fruit and getting cut off just like every other vine that doesn't produce fruit. So what fruit are you producing? If you think saying, I believe in Jesus, I believe, I believe, I believe, thank you, Jesus, for all of my money. Thank you for all of my blessings. If you think that's your work, ooh, 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 ooh. good luck. Good luck. I'm glad I'm not in your shoes. I already know to beg for my life that my works are the only thing, you know, I, I'm lucky that my sins are covered because my works are nothing to be proud of. And so, if you just think that by believing in Jesus, you're in such good standing, you know, those Pharisees believed in God too. And all they could think about was their money and their position in life. And that's what Jesus condemned. And so, I just want to point out that God's Spirit went everywhere in the world. And there's people that are living the Spirit of God that don't know Jesus. And mostly don't want to know Jesus because of what was created in Christianity. If you go back a while to the St. Francis's of the world... The Father Damians, they changed a lot of people. They changed the world. It could be argued that St. Francis practically single-handedly changed much of the world in the way they viewed this Catholicism that up until then had been seen as nothing more than a bunch of pigs like the Pharisees, for the most part, right? Using God to just steal. And St. Francis comes along and starts this order of Franciscans who wanted to do nothing but serve, nothing but serve, nothing but serve, and it swept all over Europe. And all of a sudden, you have to look at it a little different, don't you? Wow, what's gotten into these people? All they want to do is give, help people that need help. So, you know, they really changed the whole impression of what God meant, and that lasted for a while, until even the missionaries of people like the Mormons who are completely delusioned, but the missionaries were always the young kids taught to go out and do good works. And they were sent to these tropical islands like Fiji or Samoa or Tonga, and that's why these islands are all, you know, Christianized uh, until today from the missionaries. But why? Because these people saw these kids come and they came with this spirit of nothing but giving. They came with this spirit of Christ and demonstrated it for these islanders. Look, no, we're here not we're not here to take anything from you. We're here to give. We want to show you who our God is. And it was so impressive that the kings and 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 important uh, you know elders of these cultures incorporated that God into their they said that you know that looks right. For whatever legend came down through them, they saw the spirit of God in these missionaries. It was the missionaries parents that wanted to come and steal everything. Not the missionaries. So anyway, th that's the, the real truth about religion. It's the Spirit of God in you. Not the particular rituals that you adhere to. You know, Christians have a, a very high bar that they've set for themselves if you happen to believe in that representation of God then you got no right to be anything but a servant to others. Never judge anyone. You're, you're supposed to be the, that representative in the earth of what Jesus represented when he was here. You're supposed to be that image. 
So, like I say, I see it more in Islam in their o obedience. I see it more in Hinduism in their acknowledgement. They're chanting to their God, to their Krishna all the time. How happy they are, how grateful they are, how wonderful it feels to be in touch with their God. So I don't see that in Christianity. I don't see that in Judaism. I see a bunch of worldly people in touch with their money and, and the, the worldly secular system of power that's basically based on materialism wrapped up in theological nonsense and rhetoric. So anyway, you know, go out there and, and, and live your religious experience with God instead of talk about it and, and live by example what God is. Then people will see it. So I'll try and get back on a normal Bible study and start going through the Bible again. But I just wanted to get a word out to those that are perhaps missing the Bible study that a uh, little encouragement hang in there. I haven't forgotten and uh, I appreciate everybody that sticks with the Bible study. I hope you enjoy it and I hope uh, that you get something out of this. I'll talk to you soon. I'll talk to you soon.